And the deep work of the Holy Spirit and our part of that is the renewing of the mind so that our life is transformed so that we can prove the will of God, not just so we say, oh, that's the will of God. No, so we actually live and, and pursue and do that. And then what it does is it has a ripple effect in society. And so if you study world history, you will see that the church is usually at the forefront of renaissances, at the forefront of, uh, through the Protestant Reformation, Swiss watches came. Through the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant work ethic came. Through the Protestant Reformation, sewers, modern day sewage came. I go on and on. I don't want to do that. But when the church is the church, when it has been transformed by the Lord, it has a reform assignment in the earth. But the thing with reform is that reform and reformation takes great courage because what it means is that my goal is not to climb the ladder of a building I want to burn down. Not literally. People are like, he said he wants to burn down buildings. He has guns. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But my goal is not to succeed in a system that is destructive to humans. Are you, are you with me? So what we want to do as, as transformers, so to speak, is we want to let God do the deep work in us. It always starts within. I know that it's easier to, we want to be busy outside and do something, and we want to be doers, but we're actually human beings, not human doers. And so what happens is, as the work of the Spirit takes place in us, then the work of the Spirit can take place through us. One of the reasons people love mission trips is because they, they choose to intentionally be a Christian the whole week. And they're like, man, this is exciting. And it's like, man, when you put God first, you see things. Yes, that's not just so that we can be hungry for another missions trip, although that's great. That's so that we can reform how we see where we are so that we can be effective and powerful where we are. It's kind of like a jump start. It kind of helps open your eyes to things that you may not have been able to see before through engaging with other people's pain instead of focusing on your own. All right. Now, I can't get in. I'm not going to give you that one yet. So the, today I want to talk to you about uh, Hezekiah. I'm going to start in Kings, uh, 2 Kings 18. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Ella, the king of Israel, and Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Now, this is fascinating. He had a father. His father was wicked. His father did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. You can read that. It's the chapters before this chapter, right? But here's what it tells us. Guess what his mom's name means? <laughs> oh, my God. His mom's name means fatherly. Because mommy had to be daddy because daddy wasn't daddy. I don't know about how your house is. In my house, I'm daddy. Some of you maybe have a fight for that. I don't know. But in my house, I'm daddy. When you see the boy's haircuts, you see daddy. Very, it's very clear. You know. When a woman has to step up and do a man's job as a result of a man not being a man. Highly, highly, highly dysfunctional and highly destructive. Very bad. It puts the relationship in a very, very tense place because it's unnatural. It's not natural. I'm sorry, I don't care what our society says. It's unnatural. It's totally unnatural. And I don't accept unnatural stuff. All right. So now she was daddy. In, in the absence of a man playing his proper position, it puts a woman in an unnatural position and it's damaging to the relationship. Some of you grew up in that damage. And I don't say that to point a finger and say, oh, look at you. No, 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 no. God wants you to recover from the damage that was done. It's called sanctification. It's called healing. It's very important. Do not embrace and internalize things that are normal that are not normal. 
What's normal is for a husband to lay down his life for his wife, to love her, and to sacrifice for her. What's normal in the kingdom is for a wife to be submissive to her husband because the way he loves her well. You want to know the key to having a submissive wife? Don't be an idiot. Don't be an idiot. Don't lead from your feelings. Don't be impulsive. Don't be overcome by emotions. Be strong. Do what's right whether you feel like it or not. When she sees you like behind closed doors like, yo, dang, bro. He's crazy, but he's solid. Then when you want to make moves, you, you have someone behind you pushing you forward, not like, what are we going to do? That's why, this is why it's important that as the men, we learn how to seek the Lord. One of the beauties of, uh, one of the only pastor's wives that reach out to my wife, actually, uh, Virgie Santeno says this, that all over the scripture, you see men running up the mountain to seek God. But in scripture, it's fascinating how God seeks women. God pursues Mary. God pursues, and, and how he seeks after, because he understands the responsibilities that women have. That's why you don't see nowhere in the Bible any woman fasting and praying for 40 days. Because <laughs> God is not stupid. He already knows. You take her out of here for like three weeks, that whole thing is going to burn. <laughs> You take my wife out of there for like, you know, two days, we're going to go to trouble. So anyway, he removed the high places, broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, and broke the pieces of bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. We're going to talk to you about what is Nehushtan. I'm going to get there. You, you see how we were singing that song? Let incense arise. You know what that's about? That's about prayer and intercession. It's not about us burning candles to a statue, just so you know. Or you saging your house with demons. That's demonic, by the way. So anyway, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that there was after him none like him among the kings of Judah, nor were before him, for he held fast, he clave. The Bible says a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife. You know what that's about. But that is, you cleave to something the way, this is how the scripture uses it, the way a hand is to a sword. Or the way your skin is to your bones. Cleave. He, he, man, he held on. He was one with, he, he was locked in, non-negotiable to the Lord. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments which the Lord had commanded Moses the Lord was with him. Watch this. Come on, this is good. Mary's going to like this. I like it too. The Lord was with him, and he prospered wherever he went. You got my attention? <laughs> Hallelujah. So, he prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Syria and did not serve him. He subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory, from watchtower to fortified city. So he would not serve his enemies. He subdued his enemies. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Wherever he went, he prospered. See, prosperity is not, is not America. Prosperity is not because you're in Europe or because you're in Asia and they're having an economic boom. Prosperity is because you're in position. See, one of the things is that God plants people to prosper them but they uproot themselves and curse themselves because they don't believe that God can prosper them where they are. I've got a friend. He's itchy, itchy. Got to get out of Haiti. 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 And he's somewhere else and he's still not prospering. And I have friends who are in Haiti, feet glued to the ground, and they've given away multiple cars. Have you given away cars? Yeah. Some of you maybe, but he has given away cars. Imagine just say, hey, boom, hold that. A Haitian in Haiti that has never traveled to Europe, to the United States, to collect money from people who are suffering from white guilt. <laughs> I'm just playing with you guys. <laughs> just seeing if you're awake. So now, let's talk about Nehushtan. And, and my point with that is that you have to be convinced that God can prosper you in what he's called you to do. You don't have to compromise to prosper. 
You don't have to be dishonest to prosper. What you have to do is be in position, put God first, do what's right in his sight, and expect him to do something about it. It may not happen in your timing. It may not happen how you want, how you expect. But God will prosper his people. I'm just telling you that. I've seen it all over the world. It's not, oh, it only happens in America under Donald Trump. No, no, no. It can happen under Joe Biden, a fake presidency, a real presidency, any type of presidency you want, God can bless people. You, got to, you have to be convinced that God is bigger than the current situation or circumstance. That the blessing on your life is not due to an economy that is bad, inflated, destroyed, fake, crashing. You, you have to trust that God is bigger than that situation. If not, that situation becomes your God. One of the things that I've learned is that God is bigger than where I think he's going to provide from and through. I've seen it. I've seen people not be faithful and God still remain faithful. You saw I say that. All right. Now, Numbers 21, we got to tell you because we're going to talk about Nehushtan, but how can we talk about Nehushtan if we don't know what Nehushtan is? We got we to really get into this for a second. All right. Now, this is in Numbers 21, starting in verse 4. They, then they. The they is the children of Israel under Moses' leadership. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor, by the way of the Red Sea, to the land of Edom. Edom is modern-day Jordan, just to give you geographically where are these people. Uh, by the way of the land of Edom, and uh, the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Okay. We're going to stop this message for a commercial break. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? Well, we're doing this because when your soul gets discouraged, you got to start learning how to respond because souls get discouraged. Not pastors, of course. You know, we don't ever get discouraged. <laughs> you know, the suicide rate has just risen among pastors over the last two years. <laughs> so, so now this is really... So, so now... You have got to make a choice before you get discouraged. How are you going to respond? If it's not settled before you have a choice, you'll probably make the wrong choice. You, so you got to get some things in your life settled before the situation arises and gives you a choice. This, I'm just trying to encourage you. I'm trying to prepare you. Okay. And the people spoke against Moses, against, excuse me, God, and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Wait a second, folks. Well, hold on here just a second. This brother was good without you guys, had no problems, other than he worked for his father-in-law. Had no problems. He was out in the mountain by himself. He had a few wives, too, by the way. So he has no problems. And now he's going to get these people... And their freedom is going to become his pain. Welcome to leadership. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's like, I'm here to help you. We hate you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Praise the Lord. You know. So here's the thing about rebels love to revolt. Rebels. There's always a revolt. Slaves love to complain. See... They came out of Egypt. Egypt didn't come out of them. It's important that Egypt comes out of you. The fight is not just for you to come out of Egypt. The fight, the real, 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 real fight is for Egypt to come out of you. See, you can come out of Egypt in a day. But sometimes it takes a long time for Egypt to get sifted out of you. And the purpose of the wilderness is to remove Egypt from you. But here's the thing about waiting in the wilderness. Waiting will have people longing for bondage and slavery. Some people would rather be a slave than wait. I don't know about you. I'd rather be free in the wilderness than a slave in Egypt. I'd rather be happy in Little Ferry till I get to the promised land. I'm just saying. I'm just talking to you honestly here now. I would rather wait with a smile on my face than be someone else's slave in Egypt. I mean, this, this is just between you and I. And here's, here's how this works. 
in Egypt, you have to provide for yourself. Very tiring. I mean, it's, it's unrelenting. No days off in Egypt. No days off, yo. Hard work. Grind. No days off. <laughs> Dad at 41. Okay, great. No days off. Hard work pays. Loyalty. Family. All right. No, thank you. You do that. In Egypt, everything is limited to the, to the sweat of your brow. You're under the curse of sin and death. In the wilderness, God rains bread out of heaven. Water from a rock. To me, that sounds better. I'm like walking in the desert, getting a suntan, eating bread, you know, drinking supernatural water. To me, I'm just saying, that sounds better, more scenic, than being in a mud pit making bricks in Egypt. But many times, people are not thankful for where they are because they always want to be somewhere else. How do I know? I was that person. So when they became impatient or discouraged... They cursed God, his provision, and his servant. When you become discouraged and impatient, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Your mouth can bring unnecessary calamity upon you. Your mouth. Watch the words of your mouth. What happens is you become discouraged, you expect, un you expect bad things to happen, you speak it out, and then you give permission for it to happen. Proverbs says that you are ensnared by the words of your mouth. You have to watch your mouth. We have a propensity when we are discouraged or when we become impatient to spew out things that will only lead to more problems. Verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, okay, verse, uh, let's continue. Six, I'm sorry. Five. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. How are you going to call bread that comes from God himself worthless? How are you going to call the sustaining provision of God not good enough when you are just a slave? That's how you act? You get a little freedom and that's how you act? You start complaining like that? No, no, no. You like, watch your mouth. Wait, wait, wait. We got to watch our mouth. Trust me. You know what Jesus said in John 6? I am the bread that came down from heaven. You know who they're cursing? The one who set them free. Watch our mouth. I'm not judging you. I'm saying all of us, myself, we have to, we have to watch our mouth. Here's the Lord, loving Jesus. Here he comes. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, <laughs> and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. <laughs> Sweet Jesus. <laughs> Therefore, the people came to Moses. I thought you were just talking about Mo. I thought Moses was your problem. Why are you going to the guy that you're speaking negative about? Oh, because you got problems. Interesting how that works. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, <laughs> for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray. To the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Moses, this is your leader. You have to pray for people who curse you. That's okay. Comes with the territory. So now he prays for them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. You, 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 you ever see an ambulance? You know the little serpent on a pole? That comes from here, just so you know. And that is Nehushtan. Let's continue for a second. Then Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, so that it was if the serpent had bitten anyone when they looked at it, at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, 
This bronze serpent is a sign. It's, it's, it's something foretelling the Messiah. Because Jesus is going to be lifted up. Remember he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. Right? Remember that? Bible. So now this, this snake on a pole is a picture of Jesus becoming sin for us. Are you, are you with me? So when you look on the Lord Jesus in faith, there's healing. Okay? So this plague was stopped. So the person that they were cursing is the person that God used to bring them a solution. But here's the, here's the propensity that we have as humans. We like to create monuments out of a movement. So we think monument. How do I know this? Peter is up on the mountain, a mount of transfiguration, and Jesus is there. And Peter's type A. Peter's like, we got to do it. 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 So he sees Moses and Elijah, and he's like, man, Peter catches a vision. He's like, we could have three churches, <laughs> three temples. You know, people can pay $20 to come in and, 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 and sightsee. You know, like, we're going we're gonna to make this thing happen. Like, and the father just speaks to him like, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Like, Pete, shut up. Like, we're not doing that. What is Peter wanting to do? His, his, he wants to make a monument out of movement. I don't know if you're with me. We as kingdom people, this is why one of the idols of church is a building. I'm not against building. We'll have one. I'm all for that. But one of the idols of church is your building. I know this is a fact because it's the same thing with watches and sneakers and shoes. And you show your friends, look what I got. People roll in the town, they go, look at this building, look at the screen, look at the sound, look at the carpet, look at the green room for the cool people. Look, and, and, they, and, and it's, like, it's like it becomes an idol. And the reason it becomes an idol is because we have a propensity as humans to make a movement and to control it and to stop it and to make a little monument. So now the children of Israel, hundreds of years later, are burning incense, not to the Lord, but to this object. It's like you go to certain churches, and, and like Catholic churches, and then like go oh, and they burn a little statue, you know, a little candle to the statue. I, you know, I grew up, we were Greek Orthodox. My, my mom was Greek Orthodox. My dad was Catholic. They do the same thing. They burn a little, light a little candle as if the candle somehow is going to help you. All you're going to do is burn that candle. That candle is not helping you. I'm t I promise you it's not helping you. It may, it may smell nice, but it's not helping you. What's going to help you is when you align yourself according to God's word. And so the children of Israel had made an idol out of this monument. Something good, something that was God, becomes an idol, and Hezekiah destroys it. Now Hezekiah's name means Jah or Jehovah has strengthened. And when someone has strength, one of, one, of the, one of the things with strength, strength used correctly is for people, not against them. So what he wants to do with the strength that he has from the Lord is that he wants to confront things that the people put their trust in because if he destroys what people put their trust in, they'll put their trust in the Lord. And since he trusts the Lord, he's coming for those things. That's why if you listen to me carefully, I say things that push up against the spirit of the age and the dominant culture, whether it's in the church or in the world, because the dominant culture always wants to dominate and control you, and God doesn't. He wants to set you free. God is about freedom. From the very beginning, the heart of God is freedom. So he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He destroyed Nehushtan. Now, he's, he's, he's doing something very interesting here. He's, this, this guy is a real reformer. And he's pushing up against three things, immediately pushes up against three things. It, it is first the groves and the wooden images. And uh, I, I, had a, um, I had a friend of mine, you know, he's, he's dead. 
And uh, he was my best friend, the, the most loyal person. And he was half Dominican, half Puerto Rican. And him and I were talking back in the day. And he came to me. He's like, yo, Pops, um, my friends used to call me Pops. He's like, yo, Pops, um, I got to ask you this question. Like, bro, like, why does it, why do I feel like, like, like with Spanish folks, he's Spanish. Like, it's just like so much divorce. I said, because your ancestors consulted in wooden images. Hosea 4, verse 12. He was like. See, in every nation, whether it's white people, Asians are perfect. No, I'm just Whether it's white people, whoever it is, they actually worship their ancestors too. So, so there is, each culture has a beauty in it and has something that is dysfunctional about it. So you have, to, you have to learn, because as Christians, we are, we are Christians first. I'm going to tell you what black Christians and white evangelicals have in common. You know what they have in common? They are both a color before they are a Christian. That's why they always fight. But people who are true Christians behave like that. My mom asked my dad one day, he remembers this. She goes, today... Are you going to be an Italian Christian or a Christian Italian? What are we dealing with today? Right? And that's a very profound question. And I love you. That's why I have to use that one on you. So anyway, but it's, but it's, but it's the question for all of us. Are you? Yeah. I, answer, I, I said to her, I'm going to start out by being a Christian Italian. But at the end of the day, sometimes you're an Italian Christian. <laughs> All right. We got a few preachers. We got one on the left, one on the right. <laughs> I know if I go away for a few weeks, we're okay. So uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. So now this is, this is really something because he goes after three things. The wooden images, the sacred pillars. Now what these are in, in the ESV, the Calvinist Bible, it says Asheroth. And Asheroth is a, um, it's a Canaanite goddess, woman god, I gotta, I'm not, I gotta, I gotta fire one. Go here. You want me to do it or no? I'm going to be merciful to you. I'll save it for another time. <laughs> Classic. I quote sometimes Mary and my dad because they say stuff that it's just like, wow, I wish I would have thought of that. All right. So, so this is amazing. So he confronts Asheroth. And now, don't you remember Jehoshaphat was getting rid of those guys? They're like roaches, these false gods. They just, oh, they come back. It's like little roaches. They're like hood roaches. They just find their way through the walls. Like, how did that thing, it's like this big, it got through like a hole like that. Like, how did you get here, bro? So, so anyway, he destroys Asheroth. And Asheroth is the female Canaanite Phoenician god of fortune and happiness. Ooh. Happy, I'm just not happy. Sorry. Happy is your job. So now he's confronting the things that people put their trust in. Religiously and secularly. Even though there is no secular. I know we get into all that. Everything is holy now. But he, So in the marketplace, you got fortune and happiness. And in the church, you got Nushtan. This nice little thing that God did. It's like when people pull out the 1999 flags. It's like we are not in Toronto. It is not 1999. You need to really snap out of it. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea. That's okay. This is not about you. So, so, so this is, I mean, you really, so he goes after, because he trusts in the Lord, he goes after the thing that people put their trust in because that thing is going to let them down. It would be like me sitting here and not allowing you to walk on a broken plank. You may think, oh my God, this is great. I'm just going to walk across my renovated house. You don't know that that plank is broken. Someone is trying to kill you, and I'm trying to stop you, and you're like, oh, I'm free, man. I got my own freedom, yo. Freedom. I got my own freedom. I can do what I want to do. You can't tell me. And I'm like, bro, you're going you're gonna to fall 18 feet through the rafters, and you're going to wind up on a cement mixing machine. Don't do that. Oh, I got my own freedom, yo. I do what I want. Nobody tells me nothing. Okay. And then you're, you're in a cement mixer, 
with a broken leg, a broken arm, and a broken head because you didn't listen to the person that's trying to help you. How do I know? I was the guy that fell through the floor. I'm trying to save you from falling through the floor. This is a graphic image to help you understand that Hezekiah is here to help the people not put their trust in things that will fail them. This is not about taking away anyone's freedom. It's not about controlling anyone, manipulating anyone, abusing authority. It's about your freedom. So Hezekiah destroys Asheroth and Nehushtan. He refused to serve the king of Assyria. That's very, very powerful because the enemy, let me say this to you. The enemy seeks your service. And whether you believe it or not, we're all going to serve someone and we're all going to serve something. The enemy's lie to us is you doing what you want isn't serving him, it's serving you. But in reality, it's serving him. God reforms and transforms what you want, changes your desires and perceptions, and leads you in a good path, and in going that way, you are serving God, and he's actually serving you, giving you his best as you put him first, versus putting him last and trying to make everything happen yourself only to find out that you just fell through the floor 18 feet into a cement mixer. And God said, no, I don't want you to do that because I love you. So it takes courage. So this guy would not serve the king of Assyria, which is a good thing. You're going to see that this brings conflict. Hezekiah has, you know, there's things that happen with him. And, I, and I'm going to spend a little time uh, on that. But let's go to... Two Chronicles, we'll start in 29. We're going to read a little bit from there because he does, this is, a, this is awesome because in Kings and Chronicles, it gives us a, a, a wholer, more full perspective of some of the things that he did. And some of the things that he did are very strategic, not that we are kings in southern Judah, but because we are people who have, God has given a free will to make choices, and we can either choose to reform our life and partner with what God is wanting to do, or we can fight against God, wear ourselves out in the process, and never really live a life that is actually of faith, a, a life where God brings us on a journey and there's great joy, there's blessing. Yeah, there should be some persecution, but there also is victory. There also is breakthrough. There also is supernatural stuff that God wants to do. So anyway, 2 Chronicles 29 Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name, you see this? It's just skipped his father's name. In an ancient document, that's like, wow. that's like, bah, hold that. She was daddy. Daddy gets mentioned. She was the daughter of Zechariah, which is the, the lineage, anyway, good lineage. Because remember, one thing, let me just say one thing. The whole point of this, this passage, let me just tell you the truth, is not so that I can have nice preaching points and we can do an Instagram and you can go home. That's well and good, but that's not the point. The point is the enemy wants to kill the people of Israel because the people of Israel from Judah, there is a seed that is going to come forth. So the whole Old Testament context is about the preservation of a seed. The whole New Testament is about the revelation of a son. So you have all these wars and fighting and chaos because Satan is trying to destroy the seed that is going to crush his head and show people a different way to be human. A way to be free. That's right. We have to keep this in context because this is not about preaching points and Instagram tweets or whatever. So now, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. David wasn't his father. But David is the example he followed. See? Who's your daddy? He's very important. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Bam! Day one of the administration, we are going to cleanse and fix 
and rebuild the house of the Lord. Do you know who the house of the Lord is? You're the house of the Lord. Do you know what God's day one is? You. Getting you healthy. Oh, I'm good. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hold on. Wait, wait a second. You don't want the camera to come. You're not good. That's all right. Nobody, no shame in not being good. But look at, look at the day one. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them in the east square and said, Hear me now, Levites. Now sanctify yourself. Sanctify the house of God. Sanctify the house of the God of your fathers and carry out the rubbish from the holy place. Oof. Now, now check. You are a temple. Boom. A temple has three most holy place, your spirit. Holy place, your soul. Outer court, flesh. So now, those who stand in the house of the Lord and minister to the presence of God are the Levites. The Levites were instructed to take the rubbish out of the holy place. Commercial number two. Your best life now. You will never have your best life now unless you get rid of the rubbish in the holy place. In other words, we have allowed profane things to live in a holy place. You as a believer in Jesus are holy. You may be, I don't look holy. I ain't acting holy. My attitude ain't holy. I understand that. God is going to catch your, your, your feelings up with your faith and he's going to heal you up. But... We cannot allow profane things to live in a holy place. How do I know this? I know this because you would not allow yourself, if you stepped in poop, to put your sneakers in your closet because you'll smell it. And you'll clean it. When I go home, guess what I do? I clean my sneakers. I even clean the bottom of my sneakers in case I walk around my house in them like slippers so they're clean. So you, you, have to, you have to take the rubbish out. we got to get the junk out so we can be free. So this is his day one. He goes and he begins to cleanse. All right. Six. For our fathers have trespassed and done evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and they have forsaken him, and they have turned his, their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord and turned their backs on him. So God blesses them, gives them land, gives them freedom, gives them a little backyard, a little pool. And this is what they do. When God blesses you, do not turn your back on God. Don't think because you have a little money in your pocket, you don't need God. You're lying to yourself. You need him more. So now, then they also shut up the doors of the vestibule, put out the lamps, and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place. So they neglected the house of God. It became dirty. They stopped praying. They stopped serving the Lord. So now the house, so, you know, you know what that is. All right. Verse uh, 8. Therefore the wrath of the Lord fell upon Judah, Jerusalem, and he has given them up to trouble, to desolation, to jeering, as you see with your eyes. For indeed, because of this, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons, our daughters, our wives are in captivity. Do you see what happens when the man neglects his position? Do you see how destructive it is to society? It's very destructive. What does war do? War creates more widows and orphans. Wherever there's poverty, there's violence. That's not of God. That's not God's heart for people. God didn't create people to live in abject poverty. God created people to live in prosperity. Adam and Eve weren't fighting each other over air in the Garden of Eden. 
humans were created to live in prosperity. I don't know if you believe that. I believe that. So anyway, now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce math rate, uh, wrath may turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him to serve him and that you should minister to him and burn incense. Now, this is the incense, and this is prophetic. They would burn incense in the holy place, and it's a picture of the, the intercession arising for the people. The priests have to pray for the people. What did Moses do? He's praying for people who are cursing him. He's praying for people who don't like him. He's praying for, you know, so if you're going to lead, you have to bear the people on your heart. You can always tell when someone speaks if they love people, even if they speak hard, you, you, can, you can see there's some people that speak soft and they don't love people. You have to, if you're going to, if you're going to lead the people, you have to love them. You're, you're at, the love that you have is actually the capacity that you have for leading people. Can you open up your heart and create space for people? Do you care about people? That's very, very important. Some of you do that very well, and I'm, I'm happy about that. Now, then the Levites arose, and they started doing it. Now, verse 50, I'm going to skip ahead for time. And they gathered their brethren, sanctified them, and went according to the commandment of the king at the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. So they began to do it. This is, uh, moreover, in 19, verse 18, excuse me, uh, then they went into King Hezekiah and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar, the burnt offerings, and all the articles at the table of the showbread with its articles. Moreover, all the articles which King Ahaz in his reign had cast aside in his transgression, we have prepared and sanctified that there they are before the altar of the Lord. You see what his father did? Let's not make our children pay for our sins. You may have paid because of your parents, and I'm sorry, but let's not make our kids pay for our sins. Let, let, you know. So now, this guy has extra work to do because his dad didn't do his responsibility. And that's like ministry. Ministry always is usually what a father didn't do. Usually. Usually. See, because a father is supposed to have the house in order so that the mother can do her thing in peace. So that the house can flow smoothly. It's beautiful. It's a very beautiful thing. You have rest, peace, even though your kids are maybe are crazy. But, it's, but it's, it's a blessing to have a house that is set in order. Not perfect, set in order. It's a great blessing. So now, I, I want to just jump ahead because I, I cannot do this. I'm not going to hostage you today. But from chapter 29 to 32, there was a few more strategic things that he did. I want to just mention those to you, and I'm going to then, then put the ball in your court and let the Holy Spirit lead you, guide you. So he, he, he cleansed the temple. Then Hezekiah reinstated temple worship. In other words, we're going, this is like in September, they call it back to church Sunday, guys. Come on, church. We're going back to church. Like, why did you leave church? Because the sun came out? Parties. Parties. So now th this is important because he's bringing the people back to God. Listen, this is a critical part of us in our walk with God is some of us were prodigals. And we came back. And it's our job to bring people back to the Lord. Now, if you continue, you're going to go into chapter uh, 30. Then Hezekiah reinstates the Passover. What is the Passover? The Passover is remembering their national history, which is both faith and and fact, it actually really happened. And I want to just be really clear that facts and faith do not have to always fight against each other. Sometimes what you believe is actually not only the truth, but it's a fact. The Passover is a historical fact. Whether you hate God, whether you're an atheist, or whether you're a trumper, it happened. 
just so you know. So he reinstates the Passover. This, this, is, this is very important because facts don't care about your feelings. Facts are not like, oh, well, I hope everyone likes this fact today. Like, the data is, not, is telling you what you don't want to tell yourself. So he reinstates the Passover, which is very important as a nation because if you forget your history... It's highly destructive when you forget your history. How do I know? When ISIS ran through Iraq, you know what they were doing in the city of Nineveh? Destroying all the Christian artifacts because they want to erase the remembrance of their history because their history is a testimony to the faithfulness of God in their life. All right, amen. Hezekiah also, praise God, commanded the people to support the priests. Oh, that's beautiful. I feel so seen. Hezekiah used his words to strengthen God's people when they were about to go to war. So as, as a leader, you have to reassure the folks that God is on our side, that God is going to fight for us, and, and that we can move forward trusting him. And, and that's very important because every one of you is going to have to move forward. Either you're going to, listen, either you're going to move, if, either you're going to choose to move forward or you're going to stay right where you are, right? But if everyone else and everything else is moving forward, you're actually not staying right where you are. You're falling further behind. So if you're not moving forward, you're backsliding. So you, you have to make a choice to move forward in your faith. Even if it's like, I'm going to crawl forward. Like, no problem. But just, just let's, let's all move forward. In our faith. Faith has one direction, and that is forward. Now, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, and what that caused him to do is he, he went after the things that people trust in. And, and you have to understand that this is not in a spirit of being antagonistic. Okay, let, let me explain to you what I mean by that. When you become antagonistic toward a person, it's personal and it's usually pride. But when you, when you become aggressive about things that people put their trust in, it's for the purpose of them being free. So it's different than, you know, you being rude or nasty, but it's actually for the benefit of the people. So this guy as the king, he, he is going after the things that are dehumanizing and destructive to people. You, you have to see that. And here's, here's how that feels. When you're young and someone tells you, you can't do that, it feels like, who are you to tell me? But when you, when you wake up, you're smarter. Like you, you become smarter and you're not stupid. Like I have a mechanic, he works on my car. I found a really nice car. It was a seven series car but it had a six-cylinder engine. You know what he said to me? That engine is too small for that big car. Don't get it. I'm old enough, and I'm not stupid anymore. Before, I'd be like, that's a stranger, tell me. He's just a mechanic. He's going to work on it. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, he, exactly. He's telling you with $20 of gas, dollars a gallon. So, thank you, Joe. So, so this is, he's trying to save me a problem. So now I have wisdom or ego, which you could choose. You got to choose wisdom if you're, if you're not dumb. If you're dumb, you're just still, still learning. Well, I was still learning. Back in the day, I would have did something stupid. Now I have smartened up because I have learned the hard way. So, so it's important for you to understand that sometimes someone says something to you and it's contrary to what you want, but it's actually better for you. And, and you have to just say, okay, I can choose ego and stupid, or I can choose wisdom and freedom. So maybe his 37 years of experience, I'm only 38, you know, maybe he knows a little bit more about cars, he is a mechanic, than yours truly, and what yours truly feels, and the little visions that yours truly has for himself. 
Because sometimes your vision and wisdom are not, it's just not. Anyway, all right, sorry about that. So Hezekiah went to the Lord first. You're going to see that he, he goes, they basically tell him, okay, you're going to have war. Guess where he goes? He goes into the house of the Lord and he seeks God. When, when you have conflict in your life, or if you have opportunity, go to the house of the Lord. Go to the word of God. Go to wise people. Seek the Lord. Before you go ahead and decide without the Lord's counsel and advice, seek God. What has God said about it? I'm just trying to save you pain. We're almost done. Get excited. Hezekiah. Hezekiah's people. Now the people were like, oh man, we're, <laughs> we're in a problem here, pal. So his people go to Isaiah. This is good. So now his people are trained to get a prophetic perspective on the situation. You got to get God's perspective on the situation. Before you decide, you got to see it. That's really, really, really important. Hezekiah brought reformation, but not without confrontation. Change always comes at a cost. I cannot remain the same and yet hope for things to change. Change never happens until we change, right? But many times we want things to change out here, but we refuse to change things in here. Commercial number three. For the purpose of saying, listen, God is good. You know, God, uh, he cares for his people. He wants what is best for you. He, he loves you, you know, with an everlasting love. He's not the almighty manipulator. He's not here to like baptize you in lemon juice and like ruin your fun. God gives us things to enjoy. God gives us a life to enjoy. God wants you to enjoy your life. When Jesus welcomes people into the kingdom, he says this, enter into the joy of your master. It's not like, hey, come be, come be bitter with me. You know, come, come be miserable, you know, because that's a fruit of the spirit. Uh, serious is a fruit of the spirit. No, joy is a fruit of the spirit. God wants you, which is more, it's heavier. Joy is like, Happiness is fat older brother that can just throw him around, just like just push him around because joy is bigger and stronger and heavier than happy. I'm happy. You have to execute happy if you want to have joy. Good fortune, not enough. You need the will of God. You, 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 you don't need to. And you know what burning incense is like? It's like it's like a wish. You don't need a wish. You need hope. You need something that will be an anchor to your soul when the storms of life come against you and, and you experience situations that are contrary to faith. Do you know how you cultivate faithfulness? You cultivate faithfulness when circumstances that are contrary to faith push up against you and you press through. Hallelujah. Come on. Keep pressing. All right. 12.03. We're done. Lord, we thank you that you are cultivating faithfulness in your people. That you are a faithful God, a good God. You're not in a bad mood. You're not a grumpy old man. You are happy in a good mood. And your joy is our strength. And so now, Lord, what we're asking of you is that you would help us to see things from your perspective and to make the necessary changes so that we could live lives that are thriving, full of joy, full of peace, full of prosperity, and full of every good thing that you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Love you.